Blog Talk Radio. Michelo Afura Kanu Afura Kaitnut, Neye Ojira Da, Medinde Ojira Po, Kwesi Rana Hempata Aka, Akwamumai Amaruka Eti Imu Ojira Po, Ojira Mai Mu. Greetings to all Afura Kani Afura Kaitni people, many Africans, black people today. It's Ojira Day, Purification Day. My name is Ojira Po, Kwesi Rana Hempata Aka. Ojira for the Akwamu Nation in North America. Within Ojira Mai, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakaiti, people in the Western Hemisphere. Did I say thank you once again for tuning back into the broadcast? We had a technical issue. We're going to open up the chat room right now. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, and in fact, if you're in the chat room or if you're on the phone line, if you can hear us clearly, we had some technical issues just a few minutes ago. If you can hear us clearly, hit the number one on the phone line briefly just to raise your hand so we can see that you can hear it clearly. Um, if you're in the chat room, um, just send us a message. Just let us know you can hear clearly. We want to make sure that everybody can hear. Okay. All right. So we just have to send this message back out. Hold on one second. We had to reboot the program. There was an issue with the timing. So it looks like everything is back on track. So on a weekly basis, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akanto Nanasom, Ancient Authentic Akan and Such Religion on Joda on Monday nights, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of Nanasom and Such Religion, first and foremost, because we are Akan, secondly, because of the misinformation regarding Akan and such religion, culture, cosmology, um, ritual practice, and so forth, being propagated not only by individuals in the Western Hemisphere, but also from individuals on the continent of Afuraka, Afurakai, who have been infected with pseudo-religion, white pseudo-religion, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and so forth, and white culture in general. Therefore, their expression of the culture has been infected. So we deal with ancient, authentic Akan ancestry religion that has to do with our ancestry religious practice, ancestral origins in ancient Kanat, ancient Nubia, which is a title of ancient Nubia's Kanat, the Khan land, the first land, the foremost land, land of the beginning. Our people originated in that region. We migrated 2,000 years ago to the western part of the continent after the fall of northern Kemet and Kanat. Then we moved forward reestablished our Kana civilization in the western part of the continent. A thousand years later, because of Muslim invasions, we migrated further south, reestablished ourselves in the southern part of the western part of the continent in the region of today's uh, Ivory Coast and Republic of Ghana, reestablished our Khan civilization. And then hundreds of years after that, we were forced some of our people into the western hemisphere during the Musuo Kessier, the great diversity, the enslavement era, thus we ended up in the Western Hemisphere. However, we maintained our ancestral religious traditions, thus the Akan tradition in Suriname is called Winti from the Akan term Quinti. Akan ancestral religion is called Obia in Jamaica from the Akan term Obai. Akan ancestral religion is called Hudu in the United States from the Akan term Undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life. It also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession and spirit communication. We also find these exact same terms with the same meaning in the language of ancient Kanat and Kemet. Thus, in the Medutu, the hieroglyphs, you'll find that Undu means medicine from roots, trees, plant life, root work, and so forth. It also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, spirit communication. It is also a title of ancient Nubia, Undu, the Undu land, the people called the Undu people. So we deal with ancient, authentic Akan and such religion on Joda on Monday night. Hold on one second. We want to send uh, another message out. Just letting people know that we, we're back on. Okay. On Benada, Abinada, Tuesday nights, we have Ojida, which means purification. We're dealing with the ancestral religious practices of our people wherever we exist in the world, not just the iconic tradition, 
or expression of wherever Afurakani, Afurakani people exist in the world. We have maintained our ancestral religious practices. We showcase how ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives. So we're going to get into that on Awukuda uh, Akwada Wednesday. We have Egwa Marketplace where we showcase Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who have maintained their ancestral religious values in their uh, service to the community that informs their service to the community. So we showcase such businesses, organizations, and institutions. And we have our Okom Economic Development Model, which is an approach to economic development, which we have published. You can download that document for free. But that is an approach to economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values. This is a holistic approach to economic development. Part of that process in the Okom economic development model is our Operation Starve the Beast and Feed the Pride. That means on a weekly basis you make an assessment regarding what funds you would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring, and then you starve the beast and feed the pride. You reallocate those funds away from the white businesses and redirect them to the business organization or institution of the week. We showcase one Afurakani Afurakani business organization or institution per week for optimal capital infusion. So when we starve the beast and feed the pride and reroute thousands of dollars to a particular business, that business is allowed to open and expand their products and services to us, serve us at a greater capacity, hire from within the community immediately and permanently, It is a win-win situation. If we do not engage the process of starving the beast and feeding the pride, then we leave thousands of dollars, and in reality, billions of dollars. We're spending $20 billion per week as an Afurakani, Afurakani community in America. We're spending 95-plus percent of that $20 billion outside of our community, and the other uh, 5% within the community we need to shift billions of dollars away from white businesses and direct them to our own businesses. We have 2 million black businesses in America. Ship billions of dollars from white businesses to our own so we can hire our own people, serve our people at a greater capacity, and so forth. The business of the week this week is Comet Crowns, owned by Okotowa Meri Osar. She came on the broadcast last Awukuda Wednesday on the Egua Marketplace show. You can listen to that broadcast archive on this channel as well as our YouTube channel, Ujirako on YouTube, talking about the business that is the Okom Economic Development Model Business of the Week, Kemet Crown. All right, Yada broadcast, Thursday broadcast, which is also called Yada and Abada, it's Amain Sim, Affairs of the Nation, where we deal specifically with issues that confront us as an Omain, specifically as Ujiraman, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere, we recognize that we must approach our issues as a community, as an Oman, a nation, from an Amaniye perspective, a nationist perspective. We deal with Amaniye nationism, the purification of nationalism, an approach to nation building rooted in our ancestral religious values, and thus it is a holistic approach. Therefore, we do not deal with nationalism. We deal with nationism, which is Amaniye understanding what the true definition of a nation and Oman is, a living, breathing entity governed by specific forces in creation, divinity, just like an organ that governs specific cells. The cells interface with one another harmoniously within that organ structure, but they also recognize they are part of a living, breathing entity governed by specific energy complexes, and they live in harmony with that energy complex as well. We are cells within the organs, and those organs are within the great divine body of the supreme being. When we are directed by our ancestors as an ancestors to coalesce in a specific region of the western hemisphere of the earth mother's body, blend ancestral blood circles, interface with the unique expression of the earth mother divinities and the other forces in creation in this region of the earth mother's body, and also the plant life, animal life, and mineral life for food and medicine in this region of the earth mother's body, as well as their spiritual totem in this region, and we incorporate that unique infusion of energy from this region into our being. We have forged a locative identity as Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere, blending ancestral blood circles on this region of the Earth Mother's body. Therefore, we have a unique expression of ancestral culture 
of ancestral religious practice and our approach to nation building rooted in our ancestral religious values, we therefore recognize that we must approach every issue from an Amanie or nationist perspective. So that's what we deal with on Amai and Sim Affairs of the Nation. So tonight's broadcast is dealing with Kepper or Kepra and Keperit, the male and female Abosom deities of the spring equinox. So for the Ojira broadcast, Ojira means purification. In the Akan language, it also means to celebrate a ceremony of purification. In the language of ancient Kemet, Jira means purification. It also means to celebrate the ceremony of purification. Of course, our language is directly descendant. So when we talk about ancestral religion and how it impacts every aspect of our lives, ancestral religion in essence is the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions and thus realign ourselves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. We state that Ojida, purification, operationalizes nanason. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating law and restoring balance ritually to align ourselves with divine order. When we make legitimate mistakes as we're seeking to execute our functioning creation, we engage the ritual process to incorporate law and restore balance so that we can align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day. And such religious practice allows us to recalibrate ourselves so we can continue to function in harmony with our way of life, our culture, which is the divine acceptance, the law, the love of order, and the divine hatred, rejection of disorder and its purveyors. We accept that which is harmonious, and we reject that and those who are disharmonious. We align every thought, intention, and action with divine order every moment of every day, and when we make mistakes legitimately, we engage the ritual process to get back on track with that way of life. That's how ancestral religion impacts every aspect of our lives. So we deal with the purification of concepts, culture, cosmology, ritual practice, knowledge of the culture, and so forth. And, of course, tonight's broadcast is directly within that vein, of course, because we are in the midst of our 13-day Apo Afashe in the Akan tradition, inclusive of the Akan tradition within Akwamumai, Amarukai, Tifi Mudi, Akwamu Nation in North America. The Apo observance, Po means to reject. That's a ritual purging, ritual purification. We are at the balancing point, second balancing point of our year, and therefore we engage that ritual purging piece so we can cleanse ourselves and move into the warm period of the year, clean and ready to execute our function perpetually. Our new year begins at the first balancing point, which is the Octum Octumet Equinox, September 22nd or September 23rd, depending on the year. That is the end of the warm cycle, the harvest time, but it's also the seeding time, the conception time. That's the balancing point of the year. Then you go into the cool period, the cold period, the winter solstice and so forth, the shortest day of the year, but then the days begin to become longer. We begin warming up and so forth, then we pass through that balancing point, which is actually today. Today is the first day of Sestel Bere, the quote-unquote beautiful time, the spring equinox, the second balancing point of our year. And, of course, this is our year 13,018. We do not track time based on fictional cartoon characters who never existed like Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, Buddha, Brahmin, Mahavira, all these fictional cartoon characters, we base time, our calculations and calendar based on reality. So this is the 13, 13,018, which began on September 22nd this year. We are in the midst of the year. This is the median point, middle point of the year, the second balancing point of the year. We're moving into the warm cycle. So when we're moving into this warm cycle, we engage the ritual purging, purification process, the apro process, 
during March 13th through the 25th this year, a 13-day observance. Those first seven days, we're engaged in the ritual purification of our okra, okra, through akra guare, or soul washing and so forth. Today, the eighth day, is the spring equinox. We engage that our next phase of purification, which is fasting, so we're fasting today and so forth. Then we move forward with offerings to the Nanano Nsamampo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of our direct blood circles, as well as offerings to Asasea Fu and Asasea, the fertile and barren earth mother divinities. And then that culminates this year on March 25th. That's the 13th day, the final day of our 13 day purification purging observance. That is also this Awusida Sunday. March 25th, that is also the date of our third annual Etchi Sign Afurakani Afurakani African Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference, which was taking place here in Washington, D.C. So you can go to the page and see the information there. It is a free conference. Registration is free. Registration is required. So free and open to Afurakani, Afurakani African black people only. It is a family event. We will have presentations on ancestral religious practices born of our blood circles and preserved in our blood circles here in North America. Who do the Akan ancestral religion in North America? Juju, the Yoruba ancestral religion preserved in the blood circles of our people in North America for the past 300 plus years. Voodoo, the Epe and Phone ancestral religion preserved in the blood circles of our people for over 300 years here in North America prior to the Haitian migration into, the, into North America. So we'll, we'll be having these presentations. We'll have our EGUA marketplace vendors throughout the course of the day. So look at our Etsy sign page for that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the broadcast. But our 13-day purification, purging, ritual purging process, observance, APO, is during this time. But today we're in the midst of that process the spring equinox, the balancing point, a time for equilibration, the equilibration of the earth, the equilibration, therefore, of our physical bodies, a, the time that you can take advantage of this equilibrating shift and equilibrate your energy complex as well so you can move into the warm cycle in a harmonious fashion. It's no different than waking up from sleep and purifying yourself, cleansing yourself, and so forth, removing not only the sweat and oils and so forth that may have manifest while you were sleeping, the, that kind of quote-unquote material debris from your body so you can move forward in a clean fashion, but whatever you brought in from the sleep state, whatever conditionings or whatever, um, you know, energy complexes that were stimulated during the sleep state and your four way into the spirit realm and so forth, um, you can cleanse yourself of that as well, and you can be focused and conscious moving into the warm part of the day and so forth. The same thing is going on at this point of the year. This is why we wanted to talk about Kepra and Keparit, the male and female deities of the spring equinox, because they govern the spring equinox. Just like you have Atem and Atemet, governing the uh, Atem and Atemet or autumn equinox, the fall equinox, and so forth. You have Kepra and Keparit governing the spring equinox. Now, many people have heard of the divinity Kepra, whose sacred animal totem is the beetle. You see the image on the, uh, for the, that we use for the promotional Im image for the show. Sometimes you see the divinity Kepra, in the form of the beetle, sometimes the beetle inside the disk of the sun. In this particular rendition, we wanted to show a less common image where he's the body of a male, of an Afurakani man, and on his head he has the disk, and inside of the sun disk is the beetle um, animal totem. So this way you can see sometimes he takes that anthropomorphic um, image of the Afurakani man with the beetle on the headdress and so forth. So people have heard about Kepra or Kepra and so forth, sometimes pronounced Kepri, but many people have not heard of Kepri, the female divinity. There's a balance, of course, 
in creation, that foundational balance manifests in streams from Amen and Amenet, or Nyame, Nyame, while the great father and great mother who comprise the two halves of the great divine whole, the supreme being. And what streams from that foundational balance is the balance we find in creation. Ra and Raet, the creator and creatress, Ma'a, the male deity of divine law and balance, Ma'at, the female divinity of divine law and balance, Asar and Aset, Set and Nebuchadnezzar, and on and on and on. The same is true of Atim and Atimet. We also have Kepra and Keperit. We're going to go into some detail to show who this both divinities are, especially Kepari, the female divinity that most have never heard of. Now, we're going to go to our text, one of our books, and we'll put the link in the chat room. First, we'll, uh, we're going to go to our text, Ankh, the origin of the term yoga, Karakasa, the origin and nature of the chakra. We'll put the link uh, to the publications page, and you can download all the books from that page. First, we just want to go to the back. Um, the appendix of the book, Off the Origin of the Term, Yoga Kata Kata, The Origin and Nature of the Chakra, in the appendix on page 39, uh, we have uh, something brief we just wanted to share with regard to Kepra and Kepri. So we were talking about the scarab, which is the beetle and so forth. We we're talking about one of the titles for the scarab, the beetle, is Ab. In ancient Kemet, Kepra, the male, and Keprit, the female. Kepra Ab is commonly called the Ab, heart scarab. So we show an image of the heart scarab. It's a specific talisman that's placed in the heart cavity of the deceased. It has a ritual prayer on it. So um, we show an image of that. We show the image of the prayer inscribed on that, that beetle talisman that's placed on the heart of the deceased when they're being mummified in ancient Kemet. And we show that information, but the key here that we want to touch on, when you go further down to the page, we show two images. We show Kepra, we say Kepra and Kepri are about manifestation, bringing something into being out of, quote, unquote, nothing. This is tied to the heart, ab, which constantly and consistently brings the pulsation of life um, the heartbeat into being in the body out of quote unquote nothing. Rhythmic movements are a ritual replication of this process. Then we show an image of the female divinity and the male divinity. The female divinity, we say Asaset or Asaset, also called Keprit. And then the male divinity, Kepra, in this case, he has the head of the beetle in this rendition. Then we show the Medutu Keprit. It says the wind goddess of dawn. Then Kepri or Kepra is the beetle divinity and so forth. So we show this image of Asase. She's also called Keprit. Now when you read information about who is Asase, sometimes they spell her Usas or Usaset or Usaset and so forth. And what are they what do they typically say about her? You can go to any site talking about Usas or Usaset, and we're going to prove what we're saying about why one of her titles is Kepri and she, who she actually is in the Akan tradition and other traditions as well. You can go to a site that will talk about Usas or Usaset, is the goddess who's the wife of Atem, with which uh, he sets in motion the process of the emergence of the cosmos. She's the consort of Atem and the mother of Shu and Tefnut. She is called the grandmother of the deities and so forth. So Atem and Usas or Usaset or Asase as properly pronounced. It's often identified with the hand of Atem. So when the whites and their offspring say that Atem engaged in a degenerate practice of masturbation and so forth to produce Shu and Tefnut, that is totally inaccurate. When they say the hand of Atem brought forward Shu and Tefnut, Asaset is called 
the hand of the God. Just like a man would say his wife is his right hand and so forth. Also, I said it's called the hand of the divinity. The vagina or the kayak is, is represented as a hand because it grasps, just like your two hands grasp, it grasps the male organ to pull the seed out of the male organ to pull the seminal fluid, which will pull the you know, sperm cell out of the male and so forth, drawing into the female. That's why she is called the hand of the divinity. She is called Astase Nebethetepet in this particular um, function. And Nebethetepet means the mistress or the master, the mistress of Hetepet, the offering. But that symbol of Hetepet is the symbol of the vulva, of the female, which, of course, is part of the genitalia that grasps the male and so forth, so that is the hand that they're talking about. So when they call her the hand of Atim, they're not talking about Atim's literal hand. His wife, Asaset, is called the hand of the divinity, just like we call our wives our right hand and so forth. So she's called Asase Nebedetepe. That's the wife of Atim. Now, it also says she is depicted anthropomorphically, typically with the sign of a scarab beetle over her head. The scarab beetle on the feminine side is keprit. On the male side is kepri or kepra or keper, also in Akan Kopa and so forth, in Coptic, Coptic dialect in the Kopa. But in the ancient dialect, Kepra, the female divinity, Keprit. So Asaset is the Keprit divinity. She wears the beetle typically on her head. She is the female Keprit, and then Kepra is the male Keprit and so forth. So the whites and their offspring are confused about Asase Nebedetepet and Asase Nebedpet. These are two different Asase divinities. One is typically the wife of Atem. One is the wife of Kepra. We know who these two divinities are. They believe that one Asase Nebedetepet and Asase Nebedpet are really talking about the same deity. Sometimes they think it's just two different titles of the same female divinity. Then some other Egyptologists will say, well, actually, one is the Asase deity, and then the other one, because sometimes she's called Het Heru Nebedetepet, then that particular Asasi deity is really just a form of Het Heru. In reality, she is not a form of Het Heru. These are two different Asase deities. One is Asase Nebedetepet, sometimes called Asase Het Heru Nebedetepet. She's named after her aunt, Het Heru, just like you have a daughter, you can name, give her a, a middle name that's named after her aunt because they come from the same matric clan and carry the same um, certain kinds of characteristics emotionally and so forth. She's named after that divinity because she has inherited natural clan characteristics, but she's Asase Nebedetepet or Asase Hetheru Nebedetepet. That's one divinity. Then you have Asase Nebedpet, who's a different divinity. How do we know that these are two different divinities with two different functions in creation, primordial deities, how do we know that when the Egyptologists are unsure? Because in the Akan tradition, we have both of these divinities of the same name, Asase Nebedetepet or Asase dealing with the vulva and so forth, the great mistress Nebet of the offering, the fertile offerings of the fertile land, and the fertile land is the land associated with the fertility of the female and so forth, that fertile earth mother divinity in our Khan culture, that is Asase Afua. Then you have Asase Ya, the quote-unquote barren earth mother divinity, not barren in the sense that can't produce, but on one hand you have the earth that receives the corpses, but then you also have the strong earth dealing with judgment and so forth, judgment of specific issues and morality and so forth, the stern earth mother then you have the fertile earth mother where the black earth and certain brown earth and red earth is producing crops and so forth. So you have Asase Afua. Afua is a title of Het Heru. This particular Asase 
is connected to het heru or afua or afia in our con culture. Het heru is called chet che. She's called het her, ain't you commit? She's called chet che in our con. But she also has the title afi, afia or afua connected to Friday or fida on the planet afia, so called Venus. She's also called afua or afi or afia in our con. She also has the title Fi or Fai in ancient Kemet. So Het Heru is called Het Her in ancient Kemet. She's also called Fai or Fi in ancient Kemet. She's called Cheche in Akan. She's also called Afi in Akan, governing the planet Afi or so called Venus and governing Friday. Every Akan female born on Friday or Fida is called Afua or Afia, named after her. This Asase, or Earth Mother, Fertile Earth Mother Divinity, because she inherits the characteristics of fertility. She's named after Het Heru, or Afi, so she's called Asase Afia, or Asase Afua. Then you have Asase Ya, who's named after the divinity Ya, which is Wachet, and so forth. So, Asase Afua, the Asase who's connected to Afi, or Het Heru, is Asase Nebet Hetepet, who in ancient Kemet is also called Asase Het Heru Nebet Hetepet. The same Asase deity who carries the matric clan energy of Het Heru and therefore is named after her Asase Het Heru Nebet Hetepet. And Akan, she's called Asase Afua, meaning Asase who carries the matric clan energy of Afua or Het Heru. Same deity, same functioning creation, the fertile earth mother carrying the Matra clan energy of Het Heru, and that's included in one of her titles as well, the same Asase deity. And then you have Asase Ya, who's connected to Wachet and so forth, and Wachet is that great judge and so forth, has to do with the Earth Mother, so she carries that Matra clan energy of, of Ya, who is also called Ya in ancient Kemet, that is the title of Wachet in ancient Kemet, Ya, but then she's called Ya in Akan. So Asase Afua, the fertile earth mother, Asase Ya, the barren judge, stern earth mother, and so forth of judgment and morality. The same two Asase deities in ancient Kemet and Kanit. You have the exact same divinities in Akan that are actually in the Yoruba tradition, for example. Onile is Asase Nebetetepet, the fertile earth mother. And Yewa is Asase Nebetet, the stern judge, earth mother, that also accepts the corpses into her womb, into her belly, and so forth. So you have the exact same two divinities, Onile and Yewa in Yoruba, Asase Nebetetepet and Asase Nebetet um, in ancient Kemet, Asase Afua and Asase Ya in Akan. When you go to our, when you go to our book, Utumankuma, Atumukopa, talking about Atim and Kepra, and you can download that book for free, of course. We show images of both of these divinities. Asase Nebetetepet and Asase Nebetet, these two earth mother divinities, we show them. That is on page 15 of the book Odomankoma and Tretriam Pong, talking about Atim and Kepra. This is the first time that these two divinities have been properly identified in ancient Kemet with regard to their proper role, but showing that these are the exact same Asafe divinities that exist in our Khan culture that we deal with on a regular basis, part of our ritual practice. The mother and the barren earth mother and so forth, these are those divinities standing right there with the same names. Now, when we talk about the fertile earth mother, when we're talking about Asase Nebedetepet and Atem and conception because she's the hand of the divinity in that particular function, Nebet, the mistress or master, and Hetepet of the offerings, talking about the fertile earth and so forth, and the Medut or the hieroglyphic symbol is the symbol of the vulva. And when they say Asase Nebedetepet unites and she pulls the seed from Atem and then they give birth to Shu and Tefnut, which is that expansive and contractive power of the fire and the moisture and so forth, and Shu and Tefnut 
give birth to Geb and Nut, earth and sky, and Geb and Nut give birth to Osar, Oset, Set, and Nebethet, that black earth and river waters and, and red earth and rain waters and so forth. When you're talking about in the beginning with Atem, which is Odomakuman Akan, and Asase Nebedetepet, which is Asase Afu and Akan, you're talking about conception. She's pulling the seed out of him, conceiving and so forth, so that they can generate the divinities who will eventually give birth to the surface of earth, the crust of earth, and everything else. At the first balancing point of the year, on one hand, it's the harvesting time when you harvest the fruits of your labor. Once you harvest and you consume and so forth, you also take the seeds out of the fruits that you've harvested, and then you plant the seeds at that particular time, and then a conception takes place. The seeds are buried. Of course, they germinate. The roots go down deep in the soil. That's akin to going down deep dark in the darkness around the summer, winter solstice and so forth. The darkest, coolest part of the year. But then they begin to sprout and rise up through the under, quote-unquote, underworld until they break through the surface at the other balancing point, point, the surface of the earth, and that's when they first sprout up and that's the spring and so forth, and that's the manifestation of what was going on in the quote-unquote underworld during that cool period. So, But the conception, when the seed is placed into the soil, that is the conception. That is the time of Atem and Atemet, the Atem or fall equinox, that is the union of Asase Nebedetepet and Atem. They conceive and so forth. That's one balancing point. And then there's a conception and the seeds go into the ground, the germination takes place. Then when you have the spring, when things sprout and spring up, that's when you have Asaseya or Asase Nebepet, and then you have Kepra. So you have Kepra and Kepri once again springing forward. So cosmologically, what does that look like? In our book, Odomankoma and Trigrion Pong, which is Atem and Kepra, first, if you go to page six, which is very important, there's an image that we show. You see Ra in the form of a flat horn ram in his sacred boat sailing through the 12 hours of the night. On the left of Ra is the deity Atem with his hands raised, praising Afura. To the right of Afura is Kepra with the head of the beetle, and he's praising Afura from the right. So you have Atem on one side of Afura, and you have Kepra, the beetle divinity, on the right side of Afura, and they're both praising. Rise in the middle. So it's very important that we point that out because Atem is recognized to operate through the setting sun while Kepra operates through the rising sun. In the text of Ra and Aset, it says, I am Kepra in the morning, Ra at noon, and Atem in the evening. So when they talk about Atem being in the evening, the evening or the setting sun, the end of the warming, warm part of the day, that is akin and parallel to the end of the warm part of the year. So the evening point, when the sun is going down into the quote-unquote earth in the western region and so forth, the Aten setting upon the mountains at sunset in the evening as into a seed being planted in the ground. So the evening is akin to the fall, autumn, or Aten, as well as Atemet, because Asase Nebedetepet is also called Atemet, the female Atem and so forth. So the feminine aspect of that energy. The solar power entering into the Asase earth to stimulate and fertilize it is referenced through the spiritual force of Atemu setting upon, um, sitting upon, a setting upon, a penetrating the first risen landmass of Asase. Then we get variations of the name Atem. So when you see Atem, the male divinity, sitting inside of the red setting sun, you see the red disc and he's sitting inside the red disc, and the sun is setting. 
than that of sun penetrating and going into the quote-unquote underworld that is the end of the warm part of the day, the end of the warm part of the year, that is the conception phase, that warm red energy penetrating the earth, Asase, the earth mother, she is receiving or pulling that seed into her, that is Asase Nebedetepet, pulling the seed into of Atem into her so she can eventually give birth to Shu and Tefnu, she's the grandmother of the divinities. That's the setting sun and the fall, because the sun is, quote unquote, falling towards the Western Hemisphere so it can go down to the, you know, underworld, quote unquote. But at the, at the fall time of the year when the leaves are falling, that's when the sun's energy is begin, be, beginning to fall and it's getting lower and lower. It's not rising at its height. At, at noontime, it's at the lowest arc as opposed to the highest arc, so it's beginning to fall. So that's the fall. But when we get to the spring, which is akin to the morning, that's why they say I am Kepra in the morning. Kepra rises up. Kepra in the morning at the sunrise, Atim at the sun, sunset. Kepra in the radiant rising sun, Atim in the consuming fire of the red sun. Now, we show those images because we want to first and foremost show that Atim, Ra, and Kepra are not the same deity or just different versions of the same deity. The whites and offspring were trying to say, well, Atim and Ra and Kepra are just different aspects of the same force that is totally inaccurate. These are three different deities. They are Nyonkompon, which is Ra, and Atan, Odumakoma, which is Atem, or Atemkopa, and then you have Kepra, which is Tridriampon, and Akan. And this book proves that in detail, what their names actually mean. So we want to show that first. But then and we also show Atem in his solar boat. That is on page uh, 8. No, on page 7. We show Kepra in his solar boat at sunrise. He has the head of the beetle. He's in the boat of the sun at sunrise. Then we show Atem, or Odumakuma, in his boat, uh, solar boat at sunset. He is sitting inside the red disk of the red setting sun. And, of course, when the sun sets, very often it takes on a reddish tint. So that's very key. And then we show an image of a red setting sun on, on the western horizon. Now, here's the key with regard to the spring equinox. Just like the sunrise is akin to spring, um, we're talking about Kepra at the sunrise. So we say at dawn, the attend the sun rises with Kepra. And you see the beetle pushing the disk of the sun across the sky. At noon, the spirit force of Ra and Ra utilizes the Aten, the sun, to radiate its life, heat, and vitality to its greatest extent to all created entities. In the even, Ning, Aten, within the sun, enters and goes into the quote-unquote underworld to eventually appear again on the eastern horizon with the emergence of Kepra. So we show that image, Kepra in the form of a beetle, pushing the Aten, the sun, into the sky at sunrise, emerging from the underworld. In the 12th hour of the night, when you're talking about the 12 hours of the night, in the book of the Duat and so forth, when you get to the 12th hour of the night, you see Kepra in the form of a beetle. He's pushing the solar disk into the sky to manifest at sunrise. And, of course, that is at the same time the, the spring equinox the sprouting, the rising, the expansion of the solar light and so forth, crossing that evening point, moving into the warm part of the year. Kepra is depicted as a scarab beetle or a man with the head of a scarab beetle. The scarab beetle, why are they using that symbol? What, what is the representation of the beetle pushing the sun across the sky? Why are they using that symbol? Why does Kepra operate through the beetle as an animal totem? Why does that particular insect or entity carry the energy of that deity and manifest the energy of that deity and therefore radiates and resonates the energy of that divinity as a totem for that divinity? The scarab beetle places its eggs inside of dung 
and then uses its legs to roll the dung across the landscape. And we show an image of an actual beetle pushing a ball of dung. He's standing on his forelegs, like doing a handstand and using his rear legs, or he's standing on his front legs and using his forelegs, his rear legs, to push the ball of dung across the landscape. The new life emerges from the ball of dung. The spirit force that causes things to come into being is Kepra. He is thus depicted as a great beetle pushing the disc of the Aten, the sun, across the sky. Within the disc is the power of Ra, Ra'et, which gives birth to and enlivens all created entities. Kepra is akin to the explosive force of fire. Ra is akin to the radiant, effulgent, burning energy of fire, flame, while Atem is akin to the consuming power of fire. The explosive power of fire is the explosion of the fire of the sun rising at sunrise, the explosion of light that expands across the landscape. When the sun reaches its highest point in the sky, it's fully radiant and effulgent and burning and so forth. When the sun begins to lose some of its power and it begins to set uh, in the evening, it becomes consuming or burning and it becomes that red disc, fully consuming fire and so forth. And then it goes into the underworld, penetrates the earth, fertilizes the earth and so forth. That's the union of Atem and Asase Nebedetepet so that she can eventually conceive Shu and Teftun to give birth to them. Now, these aspects of the divine force work together, Ra, Atem, and Kepra. Depending on what aspects of fire are being focused on in the text, the name will vary. So we talk about um, those different titles. We're showing that. Now, we go into some information here with the names of uh, different variations of the name Kepra and Keprit and so forth because we were focused on that specific thing. So we don't have to go through that portion of the book. So let's just, we're going to skip through some of that. Hold on one second. And if you scroll further down toward the section on Kepra, Trigrian Pong, we get into some more detailed information. So we show, show, show those images. And let me look, find the page that we're looking for. All right. So the title of the divinity, Kepra, is Trigrim Pong and Akan. That's the major title of the divinity. Trigrim Pong, if you look in the Medusa, the hieroglyphs, there's a term, Chereb. Chereb became Skereb or Scarab in English, Scarabeus in Greek, and Scarab in English is Chereb in Coptic, Chereb in the earlier dialect. The KH becomes the X, and therefore you have Chereb or Chereb and so forth. So we show that, and then we show that there's a term, Chereb, the KH symbol in two R's, Chereb, which means a scarab, which means a beetle. That is very important as Chereb because, or beetle, because in the Akan language, Chere is a term for a specific kind of beetle. So in ancient Kemet, Chere means beetle. In Akan, Achere means beetle. But the definition of the word Chitre or Chere means to drag, to pull. It also means to lean upon. So the term or the name of the divinity, Chere, Griam, Pong, means the great Pong, Chere, Beetle, who Chere leans upon, Chere pushes, Chere drags the Uriya, the sun. So Chere, Driam, Pong, or Tre, Driam, Pong, and Akam means the great Beetle who drags or pushes or leans upon the sun. That is the exact function of the deity in ancient Kemet. That is his name, title in ancient Kemet. Chere is a title of Skedeb in ancient Kemet is retained in the Akan language. The function of divinity is all together. So some of that information. But now to get an Asase 
Asase Nebedet Tepet, the the fertile earth mother, which is Asase Nebedet Tepet, but then you also have Asase Nebet means mistress or master, mistress, pet means the heavens and so forth. So you have Nebet Hetepet, who's the mistress of the fertile earth and the offerings and so forth. But then you have Nebet Pet, she's the mistress of the pet or the heaven or the sky. So you have Asase Nebet Hetepet, which is Asase for the fertile earth mother. Then you have Asase Nebet Pet, who's Asase of the quote unquote barren earth mother, but talking about the planet earth itself. When we talk about Geb being an earth deity, that's talking about the crust of the earth. Oh, sorry. The son of Geb, another son of Geb is set, governing the red soil. You have Patah, the core, inner core, and so forth. But when you talk about the planet Earth, the feminine aspect of the planet itself, two Earth mother divinities, twins, Asase, Nebedet, Tepet, the fertile Earth mother divinity, but then you have Asase, Nebedet, Pet, which is the uh, quote-unquote barren hard earth and so forth, and she's governing that globe, judgment side and so forth, after the fertility takes place. Now, young ball across the landscape, the ball is buried. The female, and this is on page 28 of our book, Odumankuma in Trijuan Pong. All thus carries the new life that will ultimately spring forth from the ball. Now we're getting into the springing forth, the first aspect of the equinox, the conception, the burying, and everything. But then the of the ball, you already did the fertile aspect of earth. Now you're breaking through the earth so that you can come out of the earth, just like a beetle is a land insect walking around on land and so forth, but the beetle also has, has wings, so the beetle, male and female, can take to the sky, and, and this is why you have Nebet Pet, or Mistress of the Sky, as part of her title, Asase Nebet Pet. So the ball carries the new life that will ultimately spring forth from the ball. When Cheder pushes the uh, tin, the sun, the ball across the sky, he buries it, quote unquote sunset. Just like the dung beetle pushes the ball of dung across the landscape and buries it. When the great beetle in the sky pushes the sun across the landscape, he ends up burying it in the western horizon. It goes down into the ground. After that takes place, the boat of the Aten, the sun thus goes underground for fertilization, regeneration. At sunrise, which is akin to the spring equinox as well, the life within the Aten, the sun, is reborn. The female form of the great beetle is Keprit. One form of this abosom is the Ntoro, the goddess Asase Nebet Pet. Sometimes they write it as Usases or Usaset and so forth, or Usas, who wears the beetle upon her head. Dung beetles are known for being able to navigate by using polarized patterns of moonlight. They have also been found to be able to use the Milky Way, the cluster of stars called the Hot Ur, for the heavenly Nile to navigate. The river of stars in the sky is Hot Ur or the great Hot Hot Ur, just like Hot, the river on earth. You have the river of stars in the sky is the heavenly Nile, Hot Ur. They have been found to be able to use the Milky Way, the cluster of stars called the Hot or Heavenly Nile, to navigate the only insect known to have this ability, using light and starlight to navigate their way through the darkness. Just like we use the, the effulgent energy of the ancestresses and ancestors who manifest as Aku, Akutu, illuminated beings in the darkness, akin to stars, helping us with their enlightenment to navigate our way through the darkness. The Kepra beetle and Keprit beetle, they can utilize the moonlight as well as starlight to navigate their way through the dark. This demonstrates their quote unquote heavenly connection to the Aten, the sun, and other stars, suns, Atenu. So, 
then we go into some detail about the etym- some more detail about the etymology of the name Tridrium Pong and so forth in that particular section and dealing with the sun and these different things. So the key um, piece here is that when you talk about the beetle, the male and female beetle rising up, when you have Kepra or Keprit, when you look at the KH symbol, uh, it's the K symbol, but it can also be pronounced the Ch, the Ch, just like you have K, the CH Combo in English can be the k sound as in chrome or chronology. It can be the ch sound as in check or change. It can be the sh sound as in chagrin or charlotte or charlatan and so forth. That comes directly from that symbol in ancient Kemet, which is the k sound often written kh. The cut sound is in Kepra, but it can also be pronounced, be pronounced ch, but it can also be the sh sound. This is why when you look in the Medusu, the same symbol that typically represents the sh sound, the, the symbol of the lake, the sh sound, sometimes it is interchanged with the dark circle, the cut sound. So the name Kepra can be written with the symbol for Shepra, Shepri. And in Coptic, you'll find that the K sound in Kepra, Kopa, one of the variations is the SH sound. So Kopra, a Kopri, a Kepri is Shepri. When you have the term Separi or Shepari, that is the origin. When you talk about Kepra or Kepari or Shepari rising from the horizon in the morning, or rising from the horizon at the springtime, separi becomes shepari or kepari. But when you go back from the origins, from the ancient language, kepari becomes shepari and separi and separi becomes separing or separing or spring. Something springing up, springing up out of the horizon, the season being called spring because something is rising up or springing up, the sun is springing up and so forth. That comes directly from kepari, shepari, separi, separing, separing, spring and so forth. That comes directly from the function of the deity operating at the kepari time of the year, the quote-unquote spring equinox. You have the male divinity, kepra. You have the female divinity, kepari. This is Asase Nebedet Tepet, often being shown wearing the beetle on her head as her headdress, identifying her as the female beetle, as the Kepri that's written in the text. But she's pushing that, operating together, two, two beetles, utilizing that ball of dung and so forth, and the eggs are being placed in that ball of dung so the fertilization can be, take place. And then what springs forth from that life rises up when there's a land animal walking across the land mass and so forth, the landscape, but then at some point, as opposed to simply walking across the landscape, at some point that beetle expands its wings and takes flight and rises up in the sky. That becomes a sase nebitpet. The planet itself is part, you know, land, of course, but then the planet also has an atmosphere. So Asase Nebethetet is the fertile aspect of the planet. Asase Nebethet is the strong, barren, but strong aspect of the planet that includes the entire globe. So when she flies up into the sky through the animal totem and so forth and of the beetle, that's what we're talking about. This is the time of year where that energy shift has just taken place. It took place earlier today. We just moved into the warm portion of the year. This is why we give offerings to Asase Afua and Asase Ya at this time of the year during our 13-day Apo observance of their ritual purging for self and society. So we purge out whatever is we've picked up over the past six months from the beginning of our New Year celebration, which is a seven-day celebration in September, from September 16th through the 22nd or September 17th through the 23rd, depending on the year. 
this particular year was September 16th through the 22nd. The September 22nd was the Atem Atemet Equinox, dealing with Atem and Asate Nebedet Tepet. That was our New Year's Day, the first day of our year, 13,018. And then that was the harvest time, but it was also the seeding time. So the seed is planted down in the ground. That's good because the germination takes place, the rooting takes place, the roots go down deep into the soil, then the plant begins to, to rise up and begin to move through the soil upwards until the evening point, which is now breaking through the soil. But when it breaks through the soil, it not only begins to shoot up and reach up towards the sun and so forth and fully flower, which will take place at the summer solstice, the full flowering, the full power of the plant and so forth, but it's also breaking through the soil and discarding the debris that it picked up while it was moving in the underworld and growing through the soil underground. So once it rises up as a green shoot, then the dirt that was on it, it begins to fall off and it begins to discard the dirt and soil that was upon it so it, it can rise up. When we move through the nighttime and we rise up in the morning with the sun, we cleanse ourselves first. We cleanse ourselves externally, internally, wash the bacteria out of our mouths and so forth, and internally we cleanse ourselves, purge ourselves, cleanse ourselves externally, and then we can move forward after we've purged or purified ourselves from what took place during the nighttime, and we can move forward in a clean fashion. We do the same time, same thing during this time of the year. We started in September. We went through the germination phase and the rooting phase. Engaged, and we're talking about nation building. We're germinating the things that we need to work on and that we're going to produce during the warm, warm period. We germinate those things. They become rooted. Putting, laying down the building blocks, study and so forth, nation building work and so forth. Then we start moving to the warm phase that we can manifest these different things and we get rid of that debris at this evening point, we engage in these ritual practices. We go through that seven days of purification, cleansing the okra, the okra, the soul, the divine consciousness, the spirit force within the head region for the first seven days of this period. Then the eighth day, we have a fasting period, which is today. And then when you go through the following days of offerings to the Usamanfo and Asasefu and Asasaya, then we culminate, once again, as we said, on this Awusida Sunday with our etchy sign and such religious reversion. When we talk about reversion, we're talking about returning to our original pristine state, those ancestral religious traditions we maintained in our blood service. We're not dependent on traveling to Ghana, Nigeria, the Congo, different places to get initiated into our ancestral religion and come back with shrines and so forth and go to the Caribbean or go to South America and so forth. We've been falsely conditioned to believe that we retained absolutely nothing of our ancestral religious traditions, and therefore we have nothing, so we must go outside of our ancestral blood circles to go get something and bring it back. Insane is totally inaccurate. We have maintained our full ancestral religious traditions right here in our blood circles for hundreds of years, right here in the United States and North America. We've proven that, and this is why we're having ancestral religious reversion these are the traditions that we maintained in our blood circles. It is through these traditions that we were empowered and guided by the ancestors and ancestors and the deities that guidance and empowerment to wage war against the whites and their offspring, take up metal armaments, fashion metal armaments, as well as the use of chemical and biological warfare, root work, being the precedent set for that, to wage war against the whites and their offspring, massacre them, and force the end of enslavement force the civil war to come into being and force the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. So this is what ancestral religious reversion is about. This is what we're going to be talking about, ancestral religious reversion or etchi sign. Etchi means back, sign means return. So that etchi sign means return back. Etchi sign is a movement. Ancestral religious reversion is a movement. Returning to hoodoo, returning to Juju, returning to Voodoo, returning to Gridri, returning to the Gullah Geechee traditions, returning to Ngangan and Nganga, the traditions we preserved in our blood service. The conference is just a crystallization of that movement. 
this uh, signpost of that movement. People are moving in that direction in increasing numbers. People are taking back their power, taking back their identity, looking within their blood circles, looking at the traditions of their grandmothers and great-grandmothers, grandfathers and great-grandfathers, realizing for the first time that we've actually maintained our priesthoods and priestesshoods as hoodoo men, hoodoo women, juju men, juju women, voodoo men, voodoo women, grigri men, grigri women, wanga men, wanga women, and so forth, Gullah Geechee, men and women, we've maintained our ancestral religious traditions, priesthoods, priestesses, divinatory practices, inclusive of using cockle shells or seashells, possum bones, water gazing, various forms of divination, everything we've need, needed, as well as the adaptation and the innovation, the plant life and mineral life and animal life that we have interfaced with here that didn't exist on the continent, learning how to integrate that plant life animal life and mineral life into our systems for medicine as well as for food, for ritual practice and so forth, recognizing what our dietary and social and spiritual taboos based on operating in this region of Asaseyafu and Asaseya, this is all part of our ancestral religious tradition that nobody outside of our blood circles can teach us. No one from the continent can come over here and teach us how to utilize certain plant life animal life and mineral life that exist over here that they've never interfaced with, but we've been interfacing with this plant life, animal life, and mineral life, mineral life for hundreds of years, communicated with the spirits of these plants and animals and minerals and learn how to utilize them for medicine, for protection, as well as for healing and so forth. Utilizing certain forms of divination, like possum bone divination, there are no possums in West Afuraka, Afuraka, no one from West Afuraka, Afuraka can come over here and initiate us into to the use of possum bones for divination. We can initiate them as our cousins, but they cannot initiate us. They cannot initiate us on how to use cockle shells or seashells for the form of divination that we have maintained here in our blood circles. We can initiate them, but they cannot initiate us. So we have our own tradition. This is what ancestral religious reversion as a movement is about. And it is a takeover, it is a movement, finally returning back to our authentic ancestral traditions. People can go and get initiated in different traditions on the continent and in the Caribbean and so forth. You're just engaged in diplomatic relations. You're learning the way that your cousins, our cousins in different parts of the world, how they manifest their culture in their contemporary expression today based on where they live and that region of the Earth Mother and how they interface with them. They, you're just simply learning and exploring how they interface with the forces in nature based on their contemporary expression. But that is not your expression. We have our own expression. They're very similar because we're the, from the same stock, but they're slightly different based on the region of the Earth Mother we have acclimated ourselves to and indigenized ourselves to after we were forced over here during the Mutsuo Kesye, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. Our ancestors and ancestors directed us, okay, move to this region of the Earth Mother, blend ancestral blood circles, and learn how to interface with the divinities as they manifest in their unique fashion in this region, plant life, animal life, mineral life, and, of course, the Earth Mother divinities themselves. So we forged that locative identity. We forged that unique expression of ancestral religion and practice, just like they maintain ancestral religion in Cuba and Haiti and Jamaica and South America and so forth. And on the continent, we have done the same thing in the United States, in North America, as well as Canada and so forth. So we have our own traditions. This is what reversion is about. This is a movement finally getting back to our real traditions. And the movement is ongoing. The conference, as we said, is the crystallization of that move. So when you go to the conference page, you will see the details on the conference. Uh, for those, if you have any questions uh, in the chat room, um, you can post those. Uh, if you have any questions or comments on the phone line, hit the number one so we can see that your hand is raised. And I know for some people, uh, they were not able to uh, get on initially because there was a technical difficulty. So some people probably thought that there was 
not going to be a broadcast. Uh, but we were we were able to solve that, so we're going to just have to push that information forward to them after the broadcast is over. Um, one thing that we've been talking about also is our upcoming Ka Kaet Soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo Retreat Memorial Day weekend in New Orleans, Treme, New Orleans. Myself and Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau will be uh, conducting those workshops and so forth for that retreat. We have a few spaces left. We will probably be closing registration this week because there are a number of people who said because of tax refunds and so forth, they plan to uh, uh, make their deposits so they can reserve their spaces. So we have a few spaces left. If you would like to attend that retreat in New Orleans on the May 26th, 27th weekend, we have a few spaces left. You can go to the Ka Hyatt Soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo retreat page and reserve your space today. They are first come, first serve. We're not holding spaces. Whoever takes those spaces first, that's who gets the last few spaces that are left open. Um, we do have the 50% discount for couples. Of course, we promote, you know, marriage and so forth and the complimentary options. So couples who come to the retreat, married couples or couples and so forth, you don't both have to pay the registration fee since you're coming as a couple. You just pay one fee, and that covers both of you, just like we did at the Hoppy Metal Retreat in South Carolina. We also have the installment plan option. You can pay 50% up front of the $200 fee, the $100 up front, um, and then a couple of weeks later you can pay, pay the second half of the fee. But that first deposit, 50%, the $100 deposit, will reserve your space for the retreat. So go to the Kakai page for that. Um, we're going to have some more details with regard to the Etchy Sign Conference um, tomorrow and the following day. We're going to have a video dealing with that for some more details. We do have our sale for the Etchy Sign, the three books, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. Part 3 will be published on uh, Saturday. Or, I'm sorry, Sunday, Awusida, released on Sunday and so forth. Um, if you would like to support the work, we still are working around the clock to get everything logistically ready. Um, as we talked about before, we had to switch venues, so there was an increased cost inclusive of insurance and so forth, which we didn't have to um, cover in the previous venue, but that was an increased cost and the increased cost of the venue just in general. So if you support the work we are doing, we still are in need of support with regard to supporting that Effort. So the Etsy Sign crowdfund page this year was the first time we set up a crowdfund for our conferences. The conferences are free, of course, just like all of our lectures around the country. We're giving away a free copy of the book at the free conference. So you come to a free conference, you get a free copy of a book. Of course, nobody else really is doing that, and we do that everywhere we go in every city we go to. We never charge for lectures or, you know, conferences, and um, – to give away a free copy of the book to everyone who attends. So, but in order to do that and cover the increased cost of the venue as well as travel expense, we do need some assistance. Yet I'll say we thank you to five or six people who contributed to the crowdfund. If you have benefited from the work, please contribute now. This, this is a good time. We need to cover some expenses tomorrow as well, logistically. So if you have actually benefited from our work, Starve the beast and feed the pride. It takes about two or three minutes to go to the Etchy Sign Reversion Crowdfund page to make a donation. Any donation is acceptable. You can receive a copy of the Etchy Sign book in return for your donation. But we, we've had a handful of donations over the past few months. And in fact, we can check that out. Just when you look at the fundraiser page, F U N D R A Z R dot com and Etchy Sign underscore reversion, that, that is the, that's the page, that's the link. So when you go to that page, you'll see, um, yes, yeah, so as it stands right now, we've had the crowdfund page up for 153 days. We, right after the Hoodoo Mind Festival, back in October, we set this crowdfund page up. So over the past 115 153 days, we've had 15 people contribute. So sometimes people 
see the work that we're doing, and we're doing free presentations in different cities, giving away free books, so people just assume everything is just moving along quickly, and there are a lot of people who are supporting. We've had 15 contributions in 153 days. So a couple of those contributions were from people who contributed more than one time. So it's not even actually 15 people. It's really about 12 people, and a few people contributed more than once. So we've had 12 people contribute in the past, uh, basically in the past five months. So we do need some assistance with that, with just the people that we have uh, on our Blog Talk radio page. We have 360 subscribers to our Blog Talk radio page. So out of that 360, those of you who are listening, if you've never had a chance to support our work, we're asking that you support the work now so we can get everything we need to get together for the conference as well as for the upcoming retreat, but right now for the Etchy Science Conference to get all the other pieces in place um, tomorrow and the next couple of days. So please go to the Etchy Science page to assist in that effort. And we say, Yeda, say, we thank you for that. Uh, we, we're going to take a uh, call on the phone line and then we'll be done for tonight's broadcast. Um, it's here on the phone line number 8162. You got a um, question or a comment? Um, I was I was wondering what kind of offerings will we give to Asase Afua and Asase Ya? So you can give different food offerings. Um, you know, this is the fertile earth mother, as well as the strong, quote unquote, hard earth mother. But different food offerings, you can give different fruits. Um, you can give certain, um, quote unquote hard or powerful offerings like ginger, um, white onions, um, garlic to a certain extent. So you can give the sweeter fruits and things like that for asase afua, the more, you know, powerful, fiery type, you know, um, fruits and vegetables to asase ya. But at the same time, and we, we do it like that, but at the same time, there are certain things you may want to listen to your nananoma and samafo specifically um, to give. For example, a number of years ago, when we first set up our shrine, you know, back in the 90s and so forth, we weren't necessarily sure about certain things that we should, you know, give on the shrine. So we listened to the nananoma and samafo to see what they wanted. And when you get certain fruits and vegetables and things like that, if you walk towards the shrine and seek to give something, or even if you're in the grocery store or a market or whatever and you're purchasing certain things and you're thinking about this is what I'm going to give on the shrine, I'm going to use this as a suitable offering because the, the fruits, vegetables, whatever we're giving, they are simply centers of resonance. They carry the energy of specific forces in nature as well as ancestors and ancestors. They're magnifiers of the energy. They're like living talismans and so forth. So you, you know, you put those quote-unquote talismans there, they radiate the energy of the divinity, and that provokes the energy of the divinity so that we can have a communication. It's no different than, you know, uh, sending out sound vibrations. Those sound vibrations provoke the eardrums, cause your eardrums to oscillate, stimulate your energy, and then you respond. When we utilize fruits and vegetables, each one carries its own energy complex. We're trying to provoke the energy of a specific abosome divinity or ancestor or ancestress who carries the same energy complex, and we use the fruits or vegetables, what we use, stones, whatever we're using, to provoke the energy of the abosome and samaspo so we can have a response and we can have a full communication, physical and spiritual. So there are certain basic things you can give, but then certain things based on your clan that you need to learn directly from Yom Samafo. So, for example, as we were saying, there were certain things we weren't sure about. So even when you're going to the grocery store or to the market, you may reach for something. Your crop will tell you, your crop will tell you, no, that's not the specific thing. They'll direct you, it'll direct you to, or your Yom will direct you to some other offering. And then when you engage the process of, you know, following that direction and see the results of that, then that becomes 
something that's woven into the fabric of your practice because you have direct experience of how effective it is. Years ago, before we knew about certain things, we were directed to grab a white, you know, the large white onions and place one of those on the shrine on a regular basis. And after engaging that process and having a direct communication with Awusi, Osar, as well as certain Usamampo, then after having been doing that for a long period, we were directed, incidentally directed, quote-unquote, to a specific text in nature command. We weren't even looking for that specific thing, but they talked about how onions were given as ritual offerings on a regular basis on shrines in connection with all and so forth. So that's one of those instances where you listen to what your Insamon for directing you to do, and then you follow that. That's how we first established the offerings in the first place. The deities were possessed, the ancestors and ancestors were possessed, show us what plant life, animal life, mineral life, carry their energy complex, and therefore we will learn from that point on and we will give those offerings or they direct us through spirit communication of which offerings are quote-unquote suitable, meaning which ones carry their energy complex. So when you utilize that offering ritually, it projects the energy that's in alignment with theirs and therefore you can, re, you know, provoke their energy and receive a response. It replenishes your own energy centers within your body that's connected to that particular deity or ancestral spirit and then you have a full, balanced communication, an open channel of communication, and you have a more clear uh, capacity to, to hear what they're saying and feel what they're directing us to do so we can move forward. So on one hand, there are certain things you can give, certain sweet fruits and things like that for the fertile earth mother and the more um, pungent ones for the strong earth mother and so forth, but then you also want to incorporate what your instrument for are directing you to, or the things that they direct you not to place there. One of the things that I have been experiencing lately was, because um, I only put down water, but then after um, I've spoken and communicated at the shrine, it's like when it's time for me to get up, I feel an urge to drink the water that's there. And I've, in, I was like in limbo about whether or not I should do that, but I went ahead and followed that or whatever, and I've just been doing it. And I was wondering if maybe there's like um, an instance of that or if that is, I don't know, just an urge. No, because there actually, like actually is. Something that's been done that's, before. Yes, it is. As a matter of fact, sometimes even when, sometimes that is medicinal. So, Sometimes it's because of, for example, I knew somebody who was in a specific area um, who had traveled to the continent of Afraka, Afraka, was there for a while, had become sick, but also had run out of funds at the particular time. They didn't have any um, funds that they could receive. They didn't have funds to, you know, go to a, a physician, and they weren't able to be treated, you know, for their you know, illness and so forth. So they were kind of stuck. They were stuck on the continent, didn't have money. The money wasn't coming through, like through wire transfers or whatever. And they didn't have any capacity to do anything. And we directed them to, you know, the water that they use on the shrine to actually um, host it on the shrine so it can be charged, you know what I'm saying, for energetically so that they could consume the water and that would help medicinally and it actually did help their condition medicinally. It was no different than them utilizing, you know, some medicine. But we later on found, and this was a number of years ago, but we later on found out that that is part of a ritual practice. Just like you'll take a talisman and put it on the shrine and quote unquote charge it up or empower it, infuse it with the energy of the divinity or the ancestral spirits connected to the shrine. The same thing, can be done with, you know, food offerings sometimes to uh, basically medicinalize the food offerings or medicinalize the water or the liquid offerings that are placed there for a healing purpose. Typically, it's, you know, you're placing them there, they're utilized as tal talismans to radiate or magnify the energy of the divinity so you can, you know, receive the energy. But sometimes they're directing you to do that for 
some kind of medicinal purpose or some other ritual purpose. So that is that is done sometimes. It's, it's specific, but it's done. Okay. And before I run out of hiding again, let me just say this is a Kodawa Marita Star of Chemic Crowns. <laughs> And I want to thank everyone for supporting my shop, even if it was just to come by and take a look at what I offer. And um, but I say pie again to you, Ojirofo, for inviting me on the show and um, just the Aguila Marketplace concept in general. I mean, just the concept reawakened in me the African entrepreneurial spirit and opening up your platform to allow small businesses an opportunity to gain exposure, exposure that they may not otherwise get is a um, great benefit to the community. So, Madase Pai. And with that being said, I will retreat back into hiding. So. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, I said, uh, we appreciate you. Um, so, yes, that was that was Akotowa. She was on our show last Awukuda Wednesday for Egua Marketplace. Her business is Connect Crowns on Etsy, etsy.com slash shop slash Kimmet. Crown Kimmet is spelled K H E M E T K R O W N S. So support that business. Hers is the Oklahoma Economic Development um, Model Business of the Week. So, okay, we're gonna take one more call, and then we'll we'll be done because we're at the end of the broadcast. Uh, we only have two minutes left in the broadcast. As a matter of fact, in fact. Before we take this call, it's less than two minutes left in the broadcast. So, um, once again, I, I, we'll go into it'll go into overtime. But the people who are listening on the who are who are just listening via the computer, it will shut off. If you're on the phone line, you'll be able to continue to hear. But in a minute and a half, if you're just on the computer, it will shut off. If you want to listen beyond, you know, the uh, a minute and a half from now. You can call 646-787-8155. you got about a minute or so to call in. But this is the last phone call, so we'll, we'll be ending the show. So for those who are, you know, will be cut off in a minute, once again, we do need assistance. It will take two or three minutes to go to the Etchy Sign page. We've had a few people uh, contribute over the past couple of days. That has been a great help for us logistically. But we do have a couple of other expenses associated with the conference that we need to cover because we want this to be the best conference and we're going to be giving away these books, including the new book and so forth. So please go to the Etchy Sign page on our fundraiser, F-U-N-D-R-A-V-R.com slash Etchy Sign underscore reversion. You can see the link on our um, page, on our Facebook page and so forth. Any contribution is welcome, um, yet I say, for your support. And also sign up for those if you want your space for Memorial Day weekend in Tremaine, New Orleans, go to the Ka Kayak Soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo uh, retreat page and sign up. There are a few spaces left, first come, first serve. So on the phone line, number 3011, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, may I say, may I say, uh, and also uh, Kwesi for uh, you being instruments to, for the light to be shared on uh, some of the topics that you're speaking on. I just want to add on to what Okotowa was mentioning that that sometimes that there's an urge that I may get an urge when I'm doing a jiva, when I'm doing um, my shrine work. And um, what I do with the water sometimes is that I use it in a different place. Like I use the water after from my shrine because after I, I after I um, go into the shrine again, I use the water to mop the floor, to, to, to mop my floor with it. You know because there's, uh, I don't place certain things that come from off the shrine in certain places for you know for everybody to get it. So I would use that particularly in my house that water. And then uh, another thing I wanted to add on was that that I heard that Blue Lotus was using the temple to cleansing as a cleansing mechanism. So, uh, you know, that just that Blue Lotus has been on my mind. Probably that's probably just a, with my ancestral clan, but 
uh, that scent of the blue lotus. You know, I've been asking for it. I just haven't came across it yet. Oh, okay, right. So, and you're talking about, um, so when you see the images, um, Ingrid, sometimes when you see the offering tables, you see a number of, um, you know, animal offerings and, and stuff like that. But you also see flowers being offered, including the lilies and the lotuses and so forth. You'll see that very often sometimes placed at the nose of the divinities or the nose of the saints and so forth, and you will see those lotuses. So, yeah, that's – and, the, of course, whether we have the oil or just the scent coming from the plant itself, that's a reinvigorating scent, a stimulating scent. It's connected. I mean, this whole notion of aromatherapy, when those aromas enter into our, you know, senses – and stimulate hormonal secretions and everything else. There's there's a whole uh, quote unquote science to that, but it's connected to ritual as well. So it's not limited to what they call aromatherapy. Yeah, that those those things were definitely used. That's something we should will be not only should be, but we'll be talking about um, in upcoming broadcasts. That's it. Okay, and we appreciate the call. Also, also appreciate the comment about utilizing water. Just like we people will use Florida water for cleansing or ammonia to wash their floors or, or whatever, these different cleansing agents, people can use bleach, people can use ammonia, people can use different things, but sometimes people will be directed instead of grabbing some ammonia or grabbing some bleach or some other synthetic uh, cleansing agent, sometimes they will be directed to utilize, once the water has been utilized ritually, um, before just taking the water and taking it outside and pouring it out, you know, into the earth or something like that, you may be directed to utilize it in a different fashion for a specific reason. So that, once again, it always has to do with listening to your own insomnia. When people say, well, we want to do things the way they are done by Afrakani, Afrakani people, African people, we are Afurakani, Afurakani people, no matter where we exist in the world. So when we're engaged in ritual process, we're engaged in Afurakani, Afurakani, or African ritual because that's who we are. And when it's coming directly from our non-unsamanful, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, that means it's a quote-unquote African tradition or Afurakani, Afurakani tradition, which is in harmony with Afura, Afuraet, Ka, and Kaet then it's an Afurakani, Afurakani tradition, not just making something up because we read about it or heard something, somebody say something, but if it's resonant with our Ka and Kaet and the Unsumafo, uh sanction it, then it is an Afurakani, Afurakani tradition. And typically when we engage in those kind of, you know, uh, practices, when we do some investigation or we're led to, to some evidence, we find that this is something that has been done. So, but we appreciate that comment. Okay, so we have, uh, all right, so we're going to end the broadcast here. Um, once again, uh, yet I say we thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. Of course, this is, you know, still, we're still in this 24-hour period. We have, you know, a few hours left. This is the 24-hour period of the uh, spring equinox or separing or shepparing or keparing or kepri and kepari uh, equinox. Um, so you can take advantage of this shift in energy, this equilibrating energy to equilibrate your physical body through dietary practices, ritual fasting, cyclical fasting, ritual abstinence helps to equilibrate your energy complex. Um, Rich, uh, cyclical fasting, as well as cleansing of the head and so forth, and going through the Nananoma and Samafo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of your direct blood circles. This is all part of that process. This is the time. Even today, as well as, you know, a few days after today, you're still, we're still within that, that range of that equilibrating energy and the shift from the cool period shifting into the warm period and the upswing of energy, we can take advantage of that and participate in that. And, of course, we look forward to seeing you all at the Echi Sign Conference this Abusida, this Sunday, March 25th, 
here in Washington, D.C. We will be posting more details on that. Keep checking out the site. And once again, please support. Take a few minutes now to support. Whether you're listening live or listening to the archive, take a few minutes to support the Etchy Sign crowdfund that will greatly assist us in the work that we are doing. So again, Yedase, we thank you for tuning into the broadcast. And Yebeshi Abiyo, we will meet again. That's up.